the fourth lecture, sorry, in uh, Renaissance literature. Uh, my name is Dr. Fuzi Slisli, and we will be talking today about English Renaissance literature. This is a general overview about the uh, development, the origins of English Renaissance literature. In the next lectures, in the coming lectures, we will talk more in details about the poetry, the prose, the drama, and so on. So this lecture will mostly give you a broad overview of the literary, literary culture of the English Renaissance. Um, when we talk about the English Renaissance, we talk mostly about the Elizabethan era. This is the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Politically, it was uh, an unsettled time. It was unstable. Although Elizabeth reigned, she was queen for some 45 years, there were constant threats, plots, and potential rebellions against her. There was uh, of course, remember, England is a Protestant country at this point, but there is a movement of Protestant extremism called the Puritans. They were a constant presence and a constant threat uh, on the English monarchy. Many of them left the country for religious reasons, and they went to set up colonies in Virginia. These were the first English colonies in Virginia, in America. And, uh, and Pennsylvania and uh, these were the first colonies and it's important to know that they were established by Protestant extremists, the Puritans. Also there is, uh, although England is Protestant at this point, but there is still a substantial number of the population who are still Catholic. Uh, so there is also an element of Catholic opposition or dissent or sometimes simply called the counter-reformation. Uh, the reformation brought Protestantism, so there is a counter-reformation, people who want to re-establish the old Catholic religion in England. So Catholic dissent under Elizabeth reached its most noted expression in Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot. Uh, it's a gunpowder plot by a guy, by this, this gentleman called Guy Fawkes. Uh, it was a plot against the Queen in November 5th of 1605. Uh, the incident is still remembered today, uh, every year in England, and every year on November 5th, the, uh, across England, there is a symbolic burning of Guy Fawkes uh, because he attempted, I think he attempted to burn the parliament, so there is a symbolic burning every year across England, they still do it up to this day. The Earl of Essex uh, led the plot against the Queen too, uh, and, uh, and the plot was uh, uh, helped, was considerably unsettling uh, as far as the political climate uh, towards the end of the century. Um, but in spite of the instability of the era of Queen Elizabeth, uh, her reign gave the nation some sense of stability in other ways and a considerable sense of national and religious triumph. For example, in 1588, when the Spanish Armada, uh, the huge Spanish fleet that was coming to invade England, was defeated, uh, England had sovereignty over the seas after defeating Spain. England was practically the biggest naval force uh, uh, in the world. And her seamen, pirates or heroes, depending on one's point of view, they went around across the world plundering the gold of the Spanish Empire to make their own, to make their own queen Queen Elizabeth, the richest and most powerful monarch in the world. So Elizabeth becomes the richest and most powerful monarch in the world and England is on its way to becoming the most powerful uh, empire at the time. So in spite, of its, in spite of the instability, there was towards the end of the 16th century an era of triumph and stability. As far as 
literature is concerned, the literature of the English Renaissance contains some of the greatest names in all world literature. People like Shakespeare, Marlowe, Webster, and Johnson, uh, as far as like drama is concerned. People are like Sidney, Spencer, Dawn, and Milton among the poets. And in prose, we have Bacon, Nash, Rayleigh, Brown, and Hooker. Um, and in the center of all this cultural production and this great literature, there is, of course, the uh, authorized version of the Bible, the authorized version of the Bible published in 1611 for the first time uh, in a poetic English language that remains the pride of English literature even today. Some of um, <coughs> uh, so many great names and texts are involved because so many questions were under debate. Questions like what is a man? What is life for? Why is life so short? What is good uh, and what is bad? And who gets to judge? Um, what is a king? Who is a king? What's the functions of the king? What is love? All these are like huge questions that all of a sudden the educated elite of Renaissance England felt to some extent free to explore and to write about and uh, to give opinions on. These are questions that have been the stuff and uh, the stuff, the material of literature and philosophy since the beginning of time. And they were never so actively and thoroughly made part of everyday discussion as in Elizabethan and Jacobean uh, literature. Um, the um, a w quick word now about the humanist system of education. Of course, humanism also had a huge impact on England, first of all, through the education. Humanist scholars were great advocates of education. These are people that either studied in Italy or were influenced by the humanist tradition that was coming out of Italy. People like humanists like Thomas More, for example, contributed to the founding of new grammar schools across England in the 16th century, uh, a, 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 an action that uh, made education now available not just for the nobility, for the children of the nobility or the gentry, but even for farmers, the children of farmers and average citizens could now receive a basic education in these grammar schools. Um, also, this is the time when England built its first two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and of course, they flourished during the Renaissance and made their legendary name at this time. At the heart of the curriculum of, of these educational institutions was the study of classical literature and Latin, the language of international scholarship, and diplomacy. So Latin is still the language of scholarship, of international scholarship and diplomacy. When politicians or educated people from across Europe dealt with each other or talked to each other or wrote to each other, the language was Latin. So it makes sense that the curriculum uh, of, of schools and universities uh, at the center of it was the study of uh, Roman literature and Latin as a language. Some of among the most commonly studied authors were people like Cicero. He was studied for his style. Aristotle and Horace were studied for their theories on poetry. Uh, Ovid was studied for his mythology and Europeans learned how to use mythology in their writing from Ovid. Uh, also Roman writers like Virgil and Quintilian were studied for their use of rhetorical figures and oratorial, oratorial techniques. Students were required to translate passages from classical authors and to imitate the style of these classical authors, to imitate the genre of Latin literature and to imitate the uh, rhetorical and oratorial uh, figures. In many schools, students studied and performed classical drama, usually Seneca's drama, the Roman uh, 
dramatist Seneca were very popular to stage and to read and to perform in English schools. And also the Roman comedies of Plautus and Terence. The aim from these studies was primarily to improve the students' fluency in Latin and to develop their skills in public speaking. Public speaking was very important because this is how you gain access to the courts, the royal courts. This is how you get, uh, if you get access to uh, royal courts, that means you, 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 you gain, uh, you can land good jobs, good positions, diplomatic uh, positions, uh, lectureships, education and so on. So public speaking was very important and most of the education was geared towards helping students acquire the necessary skills for public speaking. Um, also very important as far as English literature is the development of the English language. This is a very crucial and important phase in the development of the English language. The English that was spoken and written in the Renaissance is known as the early modern English. This is early modern English. Uh, it's different from modern English. The English that we speak today is different from the early modern English. You, ha you only need to look at Shakespeare's play to realize how different the early modern English was. Um, of course, it has similarities with modern English, but also it has a lot of differences. Um, the first things to, know, to note about it is that there was no standardized form of early modern English. There was no one standard form of speaking and writing early modern English. There were varieties of ways to speak and write early modern English. The modern grammatical system that we have today was not established yet and dialect variations between East, West, North and South, dialect variations and irregularities were common. Words were also often spelt differently from one place to another or sometimes even in the same place. Many words have now disappeared from the dictionary. Many words that were common in the Renaissance don't exist anymore. Many of them have completely changed their meaning. So there are words that we use today, if you look at the way they were used during the Renaissance, you find that the meaning had completely changed. Um, <clears throat> English and other European languages, they were called the vernacular or the Vulgate. They were, these languages were considered simple and rude and inferior in comparison to Latin. Um, and in the Renaissance, there is, we hear calls for the improvement and the standardization of these vernacular languages. It's, it's very common to hear calls in Italy, in England, in France, that we need to standardize and develop uh, our vernacular languages. Uh, there is also a lot of element of pride that this is our national languages, we need to develop our national languages, that our national languages is as good as Latin, there is no reason it should be inferior to Latin, so there is an attempt to develop the national languages. So um, the literature that's happening in England, not just in England, but also in Italy and France and Holland, is happening in the middle of a a nationalistic atmosphere and a, and a, a euphoric attempt. Uh, people who were writing in these languages felt that they were doing something for the national cause in a way. The mission to improve the English language was nationalistic resulting uh, and in a way in England it resulted from England's uh, isolation after the reformation. Uh, England was the first European country to uh, cut off its relationship with the, uh, with the Pope and establish its own national church. So it, England became isolated. And in a way, that helped the English to think about going their own way even in terms of language. Uh, uh, they didn't have a reason to use Latin anymore. And in the same way that they changed religion and became Protestant now, 
and they started thinking about you know developing their own language and having their own uh, language instead of uh, depending and using Latin that was common across Europe. To improve the English language, authors engaged the imitation of uh, encouraged the imitation of classical syntax and the borrowing of words from Latin and other European languages. So in education, uh, in classes, in schools, in universities, in books, authors encourage the imitation of Latin syntax. They just tell their students, uh, uh, imitate the syntactic form of Latin and do it in your own English language. Uh, so Latin is a source of imitation for the development of English. Uh, other writers like Edmund Spencer encouraged reviving archaic native words from English dialects. He said we should just use archaic, old archaic words from our own English dialects and just bring them back to use since, uh, I mean, this is a time when these vernacular languages didn't even have enough vocabulary. So, um, so some people like Spencer said we should just use words from our old dialects and just bring them back to use. By the end of the 16th century, English had been completely transformed. Now English had a massive expansion in its vocabulary. There is new words everywhere. I mean, of course, to some people it was frightening because it seemed that their language was completely transforming. Without this English without this linguistic revolution, and I think we can call it a linguistic revolution, English, English Renaissance literature would not have been as rich and diverse as, as, it, as it is. <coughs> also important to understand Renaissance literature is to understand how the English, and especially English writers, related to other people, other people uh, in their own country, other people in Europe, and other people across the world because now they are traveling and going to all the other places of the world. And a lot of the English literature and the ideas is inspired by these encounters with foreign nations and with foreign soil and foreign countries. A lot of the inspiration for the literature comes from these encounters. So it is important to understand how the English related to uh, other people, whether at home or abroad. At home, global exploration and international trade led to the flourishing of travel literature. There is travel literature everywhere because people who go abroad come back and write accounts about all these exotic and strange places they're going to. And because <coughs> everybody is curious to know what these places are like. There is a market for this kind of uh, writing. So um, Renaissance Europeans became increasingly aware that the world was inhabited by people who were different from them. But few Englishmen or women had first-hand experience of that. I mean, in the end, it was only a few English men and women who had the opportunity to travel. Most of them could not. Most of them uh, had to read or hear about these, account these accounts only. They never had a first-hand experience of it. Uh, it's, it's like today in the United States, uh, there were in the 1990s, late 1990s, uh, the statistics showed that only 14% of Americans had passports. Only 14% of Americans traveled abroad. And most of them, their experience of the world outside America was not first-hand experience. It was just second-hand from films and books and, and the news and so on. Uh, so the same thing in England. Um, most, most of the English, English people, their experience of the world outside England, uh, they only read or heard about it. Very few had a first-hand experience of the world outside England. There were, inside England, there were few foreign immigrants in England. And, but most of them lived in London. You don't find immigrants from outside 
in, you don't find immigrants outside of London. They mostly lived in London, and we're talking about very small numbers too. And the largest immigrant community, the largest uh, you know, number of immigrants were European Protestants. Um, Protestants who were, for example, uh, prosecuted and oppressed in France, they would escape to England because England is a Protestant country now. Um, people like ambassadors and traders from Asia or from Africa were occasional visitors. Um, but this is still a limited number. Their interaction with the English public was small. Uh, Jews were banished, were not allowed to live in England from 1290, 1290. They were banished from living in England and Elizabeth I banned black people from living in England in 1601. Um, the only other way in which Europeans could meet people of different nations was through travel. But travel was expensive and difficult and needed government permission. Most English people, including many Renaissance authors, never left their country. And they relied on second-hand information for their knowledge um, on other countries and other cultures. Um, for example, you look at Shakespeare's plays and there is, he talks about so many foreign, like there is Othello, he's a, he's a Muslim from North Africa, he's never been to North Africa. Most of his knowledge about, you know, Muslims and Moors and North Africans is from second-hand, mostly travel uh, accounts. Um, as a result, Renaissance writings on other peoples and other cultures were based on stereotypes and these accounts often vacillated between fascination, fear and repulsion. Often those who were seen as foreign or different, they were demonized by the English, especially when we talk about Jews and Muslims. For the English, these were evil, frightening people. Um, similarly, uh, Protestants demonized Catholics and Catholics demonized Protestants. Europeans also associated blackness with sin and ugliness and they associated whiteness with purity and beauty, a very simplistic view of things. Um, blacks were often presented in negative stereotypes as wicked and attractive and prone to vice and lust. These stereotypes are vividly illustrated in Shakespeare's villainous Moor who was black, Aaron, for example, the character Aaron in Titus Andronicus. And um, they are less, uh, less so in his other famous black protagonist, Shakespeare's Othello, um, who also is black, but he is portrayed uh, in a more sympathetic light. Um, similar representation um, European representations of um, Native Americans followed a, a similar pattern. S um, some, some Europeans stigmatized the Native Americans as primitive and barbaric. Others, like Michel de Montagne, praised Native Americans as noble savages. Catholic countries like France and Italy are represented in English literature in contradictory ways. Uh, how did the English uh, see England, see, sorry, how did the English see the French and the Italians? Well, both countries were admired for their literature, but the French are often portrayed as fickle, vain and untrustworthy, and the Italians are caricatured as deviant, corrupt, vengeful and lecherous. The Spaniards are often portrayed in English literature as hot-blooded religious extremists. By contrast, the representation of the Dutch and the Germans in English literature, because the Dutch and the Germans were Protestants, they are generally portrayed in more positive light, although Dutch characters are often portrayed uh, having funny accent. There is sometimes like some comedy, but that's all there is. But because the French and the Italians were Catholics, they're portrayed uh, 
as evil and dangerous, although the English respected their literature. And the Germans, although they were portrayed in positive terms, they are also often portrayed in English literature as being hard drinkers. Uh, portrayal of the other communities within the English Isles, for example, the, the Irish, the Scots, and the Welsh. The Wel Wales had been part of England, of, in of the English realm since 1535, so from the first half of the 16th century. And Wales had caused England little problems. So the representation of Wales in English literature and the Welsh in English literature is largely positive. Sometimes the Welsh are mocked in English literature for their accents, but they are generally portrayed as loyal and good-natured. Because the Irish resisted the English domination, their representation in English literature is negative. Irish tribal customs, uh, are stigmatized by English authors like Edmund Spencer, so they portray Irish tribal customs as primitive and threatening. The Scots are often represented as barbarous, primitive, and dangerous. So this is briefly as far as the English saw themselves in relation to the world, in relation to the Welsh, the Scots, and the Irish at home, in relation to foreigners. There, were, there weren't many foreigners who came to England and there weren't many English who ventured to travel outside of England so their idea of the foreigners remained very small and um, the portrayal of foreigners in English literature was often stereotypical. As far as English literature is concerned it's also very important to understand how it operated as an institution. Uh, there are important things here that we need to understand like patronage. Uh, how did patronage contribute to the development of English literature? Um, well, because it was seen in Renaissance English culture, being generous for a king or a noble person, being generous was usually a status maker, you know, you would gain status. People would say, oh, so-and-so is, is generous. He gives so much money to writers or artists. So because generosity was a marker of status, kings and rich nobles often acted as uh, <coughs> patrons or sponsors of the arts offering support to painters, sculptors, musicians, players, and writers. Some patrons, like Lady Sidney, Lady Mary Sidney, even invited artists and writers to stay with them in their own mansions for a prolonged period of time. In return for this patronage, writers dedicated their work to the patrons, sometimes in the form of a brief preface, so if it's like a play or a collection of poems, there would be a brief preface in the beginning that would be dedicated to the patron, or even a preface, you know, like a three, four, five page preface, where they would make a dedication to the patron. Sometimes uh, they would express their gratitude in a dedicatory letter, and other times they would even compose a dedicatory poem or collection of poems to thank the benefactors and the patrons. Earning a living for Renaissance writers through publications, if you were a Renaissance writer and uh, you want to earn a living uh, through your writing, it, it would be a very difficult thing to do, especially for living writers. This is a time when uh, uh, people still respected dead writers. If you're a writer and you're alive, it's very difficult to, to get respect. Uh, most people res respected writers only after they, they're dead. Um, <clears throat> so aspiring writers had to uh, court patrons. They had to find patrons in courts, in uh, kings, rich people, noblemen, and so on. Uh, 
and this situation creates a lot of complications. There is rancor and competition between authors. Um, it's very common to find competition and rancor between authors. There is also frustration with this situation and uh, it's very usual to, to, to find writers writing about this frustration situation. Writers also complain about the difficulty in securing patronage because not every writer could get patronage, uh, only the lucky ones could. And the writers also express their dislike for a system that forced them to be flatterers, you know. Why should I go to a patron or, or, a, or a nobleman or a rich man or, and flatter them so they would give me some money so I can live as a writer? So there was a lot of frustration um, at this situation. Ben Johnson, for example, uh, the famous Ben Johnson, struggled to reconcile the demands of patrons the demands of the literary market and what he saw as literary integrity, things that he shouldn't compromise over. Uh, ben Johnson became one of the first English writers to make a career from his own writing. Few of his peers, few of the writers of his time managed to do that, make a living out of their own writing. There was no copyright laws and most of the periods published authors were independently wealthy or they wrote in their spare time only, which means they had full-time jobs, right? And then they wrote in their spare times only. Um, also important is to understand the book market and the publications. How did it work? How did uh, authors become published and when did they start becoming published? How did they become published? How did their books circulated? Who read them? And, and, and so on. So w we get a sense of how English literature was produced and circulated and appreciated and read and talked about and critiqued and so on. So there were two main forms of publications. The manuscript form and print, right? Manuscripts were handwritten texts. Um, before the invention of printing, most literature, almost all literature, circulated in manuscript forms. They were handwritten, laborious, page by page, and difficult to produce many. There's no photocopies, of course, and so uh, they, they were limited in number. Uh, the invention of the movable tie printing, the invention of printing, revolutionized the circulation of texts. It became possible to produce multiple copies quickly and cheaply. The new form of printing, this new um, method of printing was developed by Johannes Gutenberg in mid-15th century. And in England, it was pioneered by William Caxton. William Caxton uh, set up a printing press in Westminster Abbey in 1476. So notice this is the third quarter of the 15th century. Most of the new presses were set up in London, in the capital London, which became the center of the new book trade. So you wouldn't find printing presses in small town and villages. Mostly they are in London. So London becomes the center of the new book trade. This is a new market and of course it has to find a place in the capital. In 1557 London printers, all of them came together and formed a trade guild. So you see some kind of like organization. It's not just you know, chaotic and whoever wants can have a printing press and books are published everywhere. No. They became organized in 1557, all London printers, and they um, united um, and formed a trade guild um, called the Stationers Company. From 1586, you know, the last almost decade of the 16th century, printing presses were only allowed in London and the two university towns, in Oxford and in Cambridge. 
um, they published a combination of popular and learned books. Cheaper books, like individual plays, were published in a format that was called the quarto, the quarto format, so like an individual play, for example, and it was cheaper to buy. The more prestigious books were published in the larger and more expensive format called the folio, for example, Shakespeare's first folio, which had his collected plays. Most living authors most living authors who are still alive continued cir circulating their work in manuscript form until the 16th century. So, this is more or less the uh, cultural atmosphere of the Renaissance in England. This is the uh, impact of humanism in England as far as education is concerned, as far as the curriculum is concerned, as far as the most important authors who were studied, uh, Cicero, Quintilian, Horace, Aristotle, and so on. As far as the impact on the education system in England, there is more people allowed in education. Now, uh, the situation also of how the English see themselves in the world uh, during the Renaissance, how they see themselves in relation to Africans, in relation to other Europeans, in relation to, uh, to Native Americans that they get in contact with now and in relation to the people who came to England to travel or to work, although there was very small number uh, by this time. This is also the situation as far as uh, the, the, the publication market. First of all, uh, books circulate through manuscripts which were handwritten and it's only towards the end of the 16th century that publications, uh, publishing takes roots and now books can be published in, you know, bigger numbers. Of course, there is still state limitations and, for example, plays could not be published for, you know, the, the, the largest number of plays you could publish would be like 300 or 400 or 500 copies. There was a limited uh, number of plays that could be published for any single play. So, um, more or less, this is the situation. Um, in our next lectures, we're going to talk about more about in details about the literature itself. Uh, we will talk about the poetry, the prose, the drama, what kind of themes, what kind of structures, what kind of genre. Uh, and until then, uh, I bid you farewell. Thank you for listening. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.